Wow. Okay, I'm just going to give it to you straight, okay? It's called the gospel. (laughs) Gospel means good news. If you saw me a year ago, I'm no less alive. I'm no less passionate. Maybe a little bit more. I won't scare you though. I told you probably when I was here, the next time you see me, I'll be like this or worse. I say that all the time. I've been holding true to that for 18 years. Just keep notching up. There's a reason. Because we know him more than we've ever known him before. If we're continuing in fellowship and relationship, he reveals himself to us as we grow. And knowing him transforms our lives. Amen? It's not knowing about the Lord. You said something amazing uh, about we can preach the love of God, etc. It's one thing for me to say, brother, God loves you. I'm always right. It's another thing for him to be loved by God. Two totally different things. So I want to share the good news that empowers you to be loved by God, okay? And I really want to encourage your heart. At the same time, you'll see that it calls you in a grace-filled way to a holy life, etc. without you biting your lip and trying to be better. See, that's what would be a good answer, right? The only reason you ever tried to change, who ever tried to change their life here? Now watch. The only reason you tried to change is because there's something good inside of you working. You care. If you didn't care, you wouldn't be trying to change anything. You'd say whatever and just live whatever. The fact that you even tried to change something points that God's doing a work inside of you and you care inside. That's a big deal to me. See, that sure beats trying to change, feeling like you failed, and then giving up and beating up yourself and getting a whacked identity and making sure the tree's really bad in your understanding so then the fruit's got to be bad. And the devil's such a liar. You make a tree good. You don't try harder. You make a tree good. And the fruit's guaranteed good. What's that mean? See who you've become through the finished work of Jesus. Understand the gospel. Proverbs says in all you're getting. In all you're getting. It doesn't say in all you're getting get blessing. It says in all you're getting get understanding. Understanding will transform your life. It's the greatest thing to understand. To see what you haven't seen before. You can't be what you can't see. In all you're getting, get understanding. If you see who you've become through the finished work of Christ, it'll transform your life if you receive it by faith. You have to start where Jesus finished if you're ever going to run well. We've been caught trying to accomplish what he already did. And the only reason we've done that is because we really do care and the gospel's touched us at a level. And the trouble is then we judge our own tree by our own fruit or lack thereof and then our identity gets hindered. And then our ability to produce good things is hindered because we don't see ourselves as worthy or fit. Isn't it amazing how Jesus says a good tree can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. Therefore, you know a tree by its fruit. And we hear that and all we hear is fruit. Introspect our lives and judge ourselves. And the whole time he's not even talking about fruit. He's talking about the tree. (laughs) Isn't that amazing how we've been conditioned? To be beat up, condemned, guilty, and ashamed. On one hand, I'm just glad you have the potential to be those things. Those things are never the answer. But if we couldn't be those ways or potentially be those ways, it means we are pretty dead inside and nonchalant. So we can work with that. We can make it a good thing. I told Pastor Steve today, I said, think about it. If somebody's condemned, it's never God. And it's not fruitful and it's not a good thing. So don't let it happen. But the fact that somebody can be condemned means they're alive inside. So we just got to need to teach people who they are. Amen. I don't think we're a bunch of evil people that woke up looking how to miss God today. I don't think you're here tonight on a special service all ramped up like you all were right out of the gate. Because you're a bunch of twisted hypocritical people just kind of being one thing and saying another. I don't think that's the case. So in all our getting tonight, we're going to get understanding. Okay. So you say, well, get on with it, brother. Good news. That's what the gospel means. The word gospel means good news. Who's ever called God Father God? Who's ever heard that phrase Father God? Do you know what you're saying? The word Father in almost every use, especially in the New Testament, means to come forth from. The word God literally means source of life. Every time you call God Father God, you're saying, I came forth from the source of life. (laughs) That just gives me shivers. (laughs) So then you can't be an accident, you can't be happenstance, you're not a product of fornication or, you know, all that stuff. See, because I know my dad was alcoholic and my mom was beautiful right out of the gate, man. 
just by the world standards. My mom was a beauty queen all through high school. And we were talking about that stuff today too. We talked all day. <laughs> but the night I was conceived, dad was probably drunk. And mom just looked really good to him. I'm just being real. <laughs> but God saw me before I was ever seen. I'm not, I'm not here because my dad went into my mom. I'm here because I was seen before I was seen. And there's a time to be born, man. <laughs> 500 million sperm cells raced to mama's egg and it was me. <laughs> Swim as fast as you can. You ain't going to get there before me. <laughs> Did I share that revelation last time I was here that I got? Are you okay? Or you're not scared? You're not scared? It'd be, a, it'd be a shame to scare you right out of the gate on the first night. Since you invited me. You alright? I won't call them sperm cells. I'll call them salmon. It's an S word. It worked. They travel in schools. I was in worship in my bedroom. I wasn't quite a year old in the Lord. And I was thanking God for destiny. And I was thanking God that he created me. And I got this crazy funny cartoon picture in my head. I was on a life raft with big sunglasses. I was in a river and I had an iced tea with a bench straw. Now somehow in these visions you know where it's an iced tea. I knew it was iced tea and it had a little bench straw and I was chilling. And I was in my little life raft and I had one arm stroking. <laughs> and while I was stroking all these squiggly things. It was millions of them. They had little round heads. They looked like balloons with strings. They went blowing by me. Pew! Up the river. Well, see, it wasn't the river. It was mom's birth canal. And I had these big sunglasses. I had this nice little round white head. And I had this little stringy body. And I was sitting in the... But I had a little arm. And I was like... Now, it's not a good thing that I'm the one to get in that egg and there's five, four hundred, ninety-nine, nine hundred, ninety-nine, million, nine hundred, nine, whatever it is, ahead of me. But I just kept chilling. <laughs> and I got up to the egg and I saw this in a little cartoon picture. God's, God's awesome. Because he was teaching me that I'm no mistake, never was, never could be if I see clear. I can't let life speak louder than truth. Because truth makes me free. I can't let my upbringing, I can't let the way I was brought into the world, I don't know. Father God, I came forth from the source of life. Matthew 23, 9 says, call no man on earth your father. That doesn't mean you're sinning on Father's Day if you send him a card. <laughs> what it means is, he says you have one father and he's in heaven. Because the word father in that term means come forth from. What it means is don't limit, regulate, or identify your life through natural means, hereditary, or biological existence. You have one reason for being here because God said, let there be man in our image. And he made man in his image. <laughs> Call no man on earth your father. Don't say, well, you don't know my upbringing. It has nothing to do with who you are and who you're created to be. Well, you don't know what it was like when I was growing up. I understand and I'm sorry. But that changes now that Christ has come. Why do we keep painting the picture of what was now that he's come? Hello? <laughs> See, I'm just having too good of a day for you to talk me out of it. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> so all these squigglies shoot by me. I get up there and it looked like a big golf ball sitting in the river. I guess it was her egg. It was comical. They had goggles on. These little squigglies had safety goggles on. Some had jackhammers, some had saws, some had drills. The saws were bent, the drills were smoking, the jackhammers were broke. They were up there <laughs> trying to get in the egg. That's their instinctive duty, you know, to swim fast and the first one there is in. So they're all... <laughs> Big sunglasses. I don't even wear sunglasses. It's so funny. So I get up there. Yeah, I don't like to block myself from the sun. <laughs> but <laughs> I get up there and they're all frustrated and, and the, draw, still, the, the drills are smoking and the saws are bent and they split like the Red Sea. It was like they opened up the way for me. 
And I went right in between them and I sprung out of the raft like a little spring. Up in the air. Right in the egg. No hammer, no saw, no drill. I just... And they're all out there and I could hear them murmuring and mumbling. There's millions of them. And they're like, how do you do that? How do you just get in? They're standing over the broken saw. How do you just get in there? And from the inside of the egg, I heard this voice because it was me from the beginning. I was predestined before the foundation of the world, seen before I was ever seen, known before I was ever known. It was me. And then they all went wherever they go. <laughs> and I remained. <laughs> it's a good little vision to have. Or you might let life talk you out of it. You know, from little up, somebody makes fun of you in elementary school and all of a sudden you have a little identity crisis, a little insecurity, a little steam issue and next thing you know that builds and by junior high you're struggling to fit in and next thing you know you wonder why you're here sound familiar to anybody you're here because God said so he really affirmed it when he sent his son guys so this is going to be the clincher okay so now I'm going to preach the good news to you I just want you to know that there's not an accident in the room okay Suicide's the biggest tragedy on the planet because it's people getting deceived out of destiny and legacy and heritage and actually believing their life based on the wisdom of the world and what life's projecting. Suicide's the biggest tragedy. In some cases, it's a big cop-out. In some cases, it's total selfishness. And in some cases, it's just tragic deception. And if you're thinking that kind of stuff at all and you happen to be in this room, please stop. It's the biggest lie on the planet. Jesus didn't die so you take your life. Jesus died so you could have life. So I rarely talk about suicide. I don't know why I'm on it right now. But if your tendency is to give up, you're really, really listening to the wrong voice. That's right. It's good. Don't you dare give up. If you have that thought in you, for some reason I'm camping here just for a minute you have that thought in you it's because you're failing to see who you really are and you're letting something else define you I pray that after this night that thing would never have a voice in you again okay okay there's more people than you realize that have those tendencies and thoughts there could be as many as five six seven people in this room that are thinking that stuff every day just in this little room here not that there's not many people, but it's just a small room compared to life. There could be five, six, seven people in this room. Don't be deceived, okay? Okay. So here's the deal. The love of God was never intended to be a mystery. Like the church is still puzzled over the love of God. We sing songs why he would love us though. And it's a big question mark. Like why would he love me? <laughs> Come on, who's ever heard that phrase and that, who's ever thought, well, why would God love me? The only reason we're struggling, the only reason it's a mystery, because we're weighing and assessing our value based on life and our life's performance. And then we're looking at our assessment, we're looking at our rap sheet, and we're wondering what there is to love about me. Well, that's not what God loves, that's what God changes. See, what God loves is who He created you to be. God loves your destiny. God loves your heritage in the Lord. God loves your potential, your created value. See, we're trying to find the love of God in some mystical way, and we're trying to relate to how God can love me, but we're identifying me based on the life we know. That's the life that dies. That's the life that we say no to. That's the life that we put off. What we realize is we were living what we were never created to be. We were born into a lie. We were born into Adam and we must be born again. And because God never lost sight of our created value, our destiny, our potential, he never changed his mind about our value. So he seems to think it's worth the blood of his son Jesus for you and me to live. So he must see a whole lot more than we've produced. He must know what we look like when he's inside of us. He must know what we're capable of in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Do you get it? So the love of God is not a mystery. Please don't get trapped ever again saying, I can't believe God would love me. Believe it! 
Because he loves what he created you to be. He loves your destiny. He paid the price for you to write legacy. Not to mull around in where you've been and what you've done. That's not who you are. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. He came to shine the light on that kind of darkness to change your life forever. It's not like, well, we're always sinners. Well, you know, we're just going to get messed up. It's wonder God even considers us. Ah! He doesn't tolerate you. He loves you. But this love is out to change our lives. See, if we don't see this thing clear, the tree will never be made good. We'll still think we are what we used to be. And we'll just try to incorporate a confession of his love into our life. But it doesn't work and we're puzzled by it. This gospel makes the tree good. It says my life's worth living. Man, God has to love me or he'd have never sent his son. See, here's the deal. The measuring stick of God's love is Christ crucified. The fact that he sent his son is the fact that God loves us. It's not the circumstances of your life, church. You have to make sure that you don't assess your life and say, well, I don't know why this happened and why this happened and this. I thought God loved me. None of those things should have the power to question his love because his love's already settled through the sending of his son. If you're going to question his love based on the circumstances of life, how can you ever be rooted and grounded in love? Because when the waves come and the winds, you won't be a wise man. It's Matthew 7. I read it in there. It's pretty cool. You guys all right? You sure you're all right? I'm being real easy on you. I'm really preaching good news. Come on, he died to restore our created value. He didn't just die so you could limp along. He didn't just die to like forgive you for what you did. It's to make you brand new, to show you who you've always been in the first place. See, on your darkest day, he knew who you were. See, that's what love does. Love doesn't lose sight of potential. Love doesn't lose sight of destiny. Love doesn't say, well, if they were going to get saved, they'd get saved by now. Well, if they were going to get it right, they'd have got it right by now. Love doesn't do that. Love never fails. Love says, I know what you're capable of. I know your potential. I know what you can do in me. That's what love says. So on your darkest day, on your most willful, rebellious venture, God said, I know who you are and that's not you. And God saw what you're capable of in your creative value. And he seems to think that's worth the death of his son to keep that alive. Come on, that's the love of God. So he asked us to come and repent and change the way we think. Deny ourself. Pick up our cross and follow King Jesus. That's the gospel. And the greatest day of your life is when you understand that you were not created for you. You were created for the image of God. He said, let us make man in our... And in the likeness of God, he made man. You want to look there quick? Go to Genesis 1 with me real quick. You'll see that he says it three times in two verses. He must be making a point. Yeah, it's just simple. See, verse 26 says, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth. I like this, over the, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You have dominion over the creep. And it's not people. <laughs> not people. <laughs> so, look. See, verse 26 is awesome. Because you can see where man came from in the Bible if you believe the Bible. Do you good to believe the Bible? Man. See, you start believing the Word of God. It's not some weak excuse. It's not some crutch that limps you along. You start believing the Gospel and God reveals Himself to you as you believe. And after a while, you don't even have to believe. You just see, you know, you come to realize, face your reality. I'm not growing in my faith. I just know. Well, I just believe God is. <laughs> no, I know God is. <laughs> we hang out. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I'm not trying to believe in God. <laughs> he is. Are you guys all right? <laughs> Am I a little too flaky? Am I okay? Am I still all right? Okay, because I'm trying to behave a little. But we're getting there. Well, don't be careful. <laughs> I 
Watch this. God said, let us make man. But verse 27 is more awesome. It says he did it. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> oh, that's, that's a big deal. Man, don't read this thing to preach it. Read this thing to become it, to know it, to see it. Don't just read it because it's the Christian thing to do. A lot of truth here. Get a lot of answers right here. So God created man. Whoa, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. You see, he keeps repeating this. Let us make man in our image. So God did it. He created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Sounds almost redundant. He says it twice. He just. He wants us to see that. Right. And then guess what he did? Man, he did not curse us. He blessed us. And said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. That's not some power trip. What did he do? He created us in his image and then said, multiply and fill the earth with my image. He's not talking about people, numbers. He's emphasizing that he made us in his image. Now fill the earth and multiply it and fill the earth with me. You get it? See, it's one thing to say you're a son. It's one thing to say you're a daughter. It's another thing to walk in the image and nature of God and understand it's your destiny, your calling, your birthright. Your birthright. Is to walk in the image of God. And the image of God is love. You know how you know you can define the image of God as love? Because John two places says. I give you a new commandment. Yet it is no new commandment. It's what you had from the beginning. To be made in God's image is to be made to love. Not need love. To be love. The only reason men need love is because they were cut off from the source of love. And you got to get grafted back into the vine so the sap can fill your branch <laughs> and you can be fruitful again. You guys getting this? It's so simple, it's scary. So like, we could just finish the whole weekend. I could just fly back home. This is just, I won't. Because I... <laughs> I probably want to preach some more, but but we could just wrap it up right here. So the whole reason you and me are alive is to love, period. It's why we're Christians. It's not blessing. It's not provision. It's not just a better job. It's not a better parking place. It's not so nobody ever treats you bad again. You're not a Christian, so your life works well. You're a Christian because you're getting restored back to the Father through the Son so His nature can consume you, possess you, and live through you. And so the whole earth can be filled with His glory. Huh. That's why you're a Christian. And if you're a Christian for any other reason, you're going to get discouraged, deceived, confused, and you're going to live up and down. Because you'll wonder where God is and why isn't He blessing you and I thought He loved me. And you'll question things that are already answered through a lack of understanding and be destroyed again and again for the lack of knowledge. And you'll make it all about you when it's all about His image. And you'll have a reason to be discouraged, not be where you should be, whatever all that means we say. <laughs> I've listened to us talk. Well, I know I shouldn't. I just not where I should be right now. What are you thinking? Stop. What? See, when has this thing ever been just about us and incorporating him into our life? It's about him becoming our life. Look, everything that he's asking you to give him is what you inherited through Adam's fall. <laughs> There's not one thing he's asking you to give that you ever created to be. Hello? Why do you covet what was never yours? Why do you become so familiar and endeared with something that was never yours in the first place? It's all perversion. Why does he say, if any man come after me, deny himself? Why is that first? You were never made for you. You're made for his image. If any man, that means we're all invited. When he says man, it's a universe, it's for humans. Man, woman, don't be excluded, women. 
When I say sons, I mean daughters too. It's just quicker to say sons. If I'm a bride, you can be a son tonight. Bear with me. See, I'm cool being a bride. I can go with it. I'll bat my eyes if I have to, but I am a bride. <laughs> and I look so good to him. He made me beautiful. He washed me clean of sin. When he sees me, he doesn't see failure. He sees destiny. When he sees me, he sees sonship. He doesn't see what I did wrong 10 years ago. When he sees me, he sees one that he predestined before time. And he thinks I look really good in Christ. And he thinks Christ really looks good in me. The Bible says that to me, to him, I'm the fragrance of Christ. So the Bible says. And the Bible says that I get to diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So this thing's a whole lot more than a passport to heaven. It's a whole lot more than God fixing the stuff I broke. It's about him giving me identity and straightening out the why behind my life so it's not a mystery anymore. So that I can never be deceived out of another day. Never sell cheap and short again since I'm already bought with a price. So now I'm not for sale. Yay. It's good. No vacancy signs flashing all over me. A house fulfilled and complete. Isn't that awesome? That's why I act this way. Now, you don't have to act this way, so don't be afraid to get the revelation. That doesn't mean you'll act like me. It's just the way I handle it. It just does me good. <laughs> Yay for Jesus. If any man come after me, let him first deny him. Look, you wouldn't put metal in a microwave. It wasn't made for that. Come on, read the manufacturer's handbook. You just don't put metal in the conventional microwave. Did anybody ever do that by mistake? Did you ever pop a plate in there and put the little lid over top, the little cover, and then, whoa, you hit the thing so quick, you're like, wow! And then you found there's a little fork laying on the plate. Right? Whoever did that had a little bit of foil cover and something, and you hit a, whoa! Microwaves will manifest <laughs> with metal in them and not the way they were created to manifest. See, if you put metal in a microwave long enough, you'll ruin the product. You'll destroy it. Why? It wasn't made for that. Look, if you live for yourself long enough, read the manufacturer's handbook. You think the world's your problem? You think God's your problem? You think the devil's your you live for yourself long enough. You read the manufacturer's handbook. You were not made for you. You were made for his image. And you live for yourself long enough. You'll ruin the appearance of the product. And you'll blame everything but you. Because it's all about you. But until you die to you. You'll never be free. Now I'm talking straight and plain. I'm smiling. I'm not being mean. I'm being very truthful. Come on, how many of us were in that place where we had it all figured out of why we were the way we were and we had everybody's fault figured out in it and what percentage they played and we had our whole stuff justified. <laughs> and you weren't blessed and you weren't free and you weren't fruitful and you weren't prospering. You were just right and they were wrong. <laughs> okay, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Yahoo! You don't want right and wrong. Because if you're right, somebody's wrong. If God was just right, we're wrong. He's righteous. His judgment makes everything right. Here's how God thinks about justice and righteousness and right and wrongness. Jesus, would you just put everything they ever did on you? Would you die of sin? Would you become sin on the cross so they could become free and get back to what I created them to be so we can get that lie off of them and peel them clean forever of the fall of man? Can we confound the wisdom of the wise? And Would you go and would you be the lamb slain so they could get back to the original value? Absolutely. I have no other thought. That's what love would do. I will lay down my life for them. That's Jesus. And we're like, why wouldn't they did it if they wouldn't? Well, they shouldn't have started it. Well, you don't know how I feel. Well, you're... Lived their whole lives like that. 
And Jesus is taking everything you ever did on you and you're pointing the finger at everybody else to justify you. Hear how perverted that is? Be real. Who, who of us have ever taken advantage of one another, lived at the expense of one another, said something to a friend to find a little favor, even if it slighted your other friend a little? Living at the expense of one another. You know what I mean by that? And love lays down its life for another. So we're created to love and we're found living at the expense of one another, justifying ourselves at the cost of one another. Do you hear how twisted it all got? So we were all born into Adam. It's a bummer. We must be born. How we turned that into a trip to heaven, I'll never know. It's the transformation of life and heaven coming back into you. It's not you going to heaven. It's heaven coming back into you. I'm glad my name's in the book of life. Yay, I am. I mean it. I'm not being sarcastic. But I'm one with one that's eternal. Of course I'm going to live forever. My, look, my, my motivation for being a Christian is not everlasting life. It's being one with Him and fulfilling the reason He created me. Come on, if your only motive is everlasting life, it's still about you. And it's still selfish. It's not even about why you were created. It's just, look, man, I know I got my issues. I know I got my stuff, but I don't ever want to die, man. I want to get in there. I'm going to pray the prayer. Ah! And then we're like, well, at least they prayed the prayer. <laughs> Duh. Man, pray the prayer, but get a transformed life. <laughs> Understand what you're doing. Come on. It's no new commandment. It's what we had from the beginning. If God said, let us make man in God's image and God is love, then God made man to love. To be loved. Every one of us was born in the desperate need of love. Every one of us was born in identity crisis. Why? Because the day Adam ate the tree was the day he surely died. We well, didn't fall over dead. So what died? We all, we're all taught to say his spirit. Well, what's that even mean? People say, well, his spirit died. Okay, but what's that really mean? The day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. What it means is who you're created to be seems to be lost. It dies. The image. He lost the image. Adam didn't just sin. He took on the nature of God's enemy and became completely self-centered and self-serving. He blamed his sin on God and his wife. She blamed it on the devil. What's this you did? It was the woman you gave me. <laughs> Come on, paraphrase that. Hey, don't look at me, pal. Remember, he said, <laughs> Don't look at me, pal. Look, if you, if you, if you, <laughs> wouldn't have gave me, me, the woman, I probably wouldn't have ate the stupid drink. Isn't that what he's saying? It was the woman she gave me to eat. It was the woman you gave me. She gave me to eat. Come on. Adam, did you eat the tree is a yes or no question. Somehow he answered real long and got out of it. So he looks to the woman and says, what is this you've done? The devil, he made me do it. That was her answer. I know he says he gave, she gave to her husband in the garden who was with her. It doesn't mean he was standing there listening to the same voice. The reason you know that is because God, when God charged Adam for what he did and told him what was going to come upon him, he said, because you heeded the voice of your wife instead of me, he didn't bring the devil into it. Now, let me tell you what happened. The devil made a convert and a disciple. And then she reproduced after her kind. And that's how God made man to reproduce after his own kind. So Satan just came and counterfeited and perverted the created value of man. And he just got the woman to say what he was saying. And Adam heeded what he was saying through the woman instead of God. It's right there in your Bible. He didn't say because you heeded the voice of the serpent. 
He said, because you heeded the voice of the woman. And when he heeded the voice of the woman, she was saying what the devil said. Come on, that's serious. It happens to us all the time. Opinions, human reasoning, human wisdom. Sharing your pain with the wrong people. And they cheer you on in your pain. And they affirm how you feel and say they'd feel even worse if it was them. And then they support you in your pain. When Jesus is trying to teach you the heart of God, that will heal you from pain forever. Yeah. It'll take away your right to be so broken. See, you don't need to be fixed from being broken. You need to understand how to not be broken. You don't need God to come and heal your pain. You need God to come and teach you the heart of God so that the pain doesn't have a landing strip. Because if it's still about you, your pain waiting to happen. If somebody owes you, somebody's going to fail you. If your expectation and your faith and your trust is in men, you're in big trouble. Who's learned that one? You don't put your trust in flesh. You put your trust in him and then you manifest him to flesh. And you never let a human being ever again be the reason for who you are. You let the one that lives inside of you be the reason for who you are. You don't say, well, I'm this way because of this, that or what I've been through. or what. That's to make those things Lord. Now, all of a sudden, those things have the right to define you. And what he did is second best. No, your faith is in his finished work. You're not a product of what you've been through. You're a product of what he's been through. And faith positions yourself there. And look, truly, I'm sorry we went through some of the hell we went through and that things were as bad as it was. But it was all a strategy to get your heart hurt, hard and confused so that when the good news came, you couldn't hear it as good. And that you were more fixed on where you've been instead of where he's been. Come on, I'm preaching to you now. I didn't fly here to not preach. That's why I couldn't quit and go home a while ago. <laughs> you guys follow me? Yeah. Come on, this is a powerful gospel. Yeah. But I am not here to preach some just bless me thing. Just God making my little world go good. No, he's transforming my life that even in the face of adversity and injustice and unfairness, I shine like a light. My Bible tells me and you in Philippians 2 to do all things, not some things, all things without grumbling and complaining. Why? So the world we live in sees us as harmless, innocent children in the midst of a perverse life and way of thinking. In the midst of a perverse world that doesn't think like that. Do all things, not some things, all things without grumbling and complaining. So the world sees you as harmless, innocent children in the midst of a perverse generation whom you shine forth as a light, holding forth the word of life. Come on, that's the gospel, Philippians 2. Yeah. How many things? Now watch this. When we finally understand and realize it's not about me, it's about his image, to not grumble and complain becomes very easy. When you grumble and complain, it's an automatic indictment that you're thinking for yourself. Watch this. If you're not thinking for yourself, it's impossible to be discouraged. Because God's your motivation and he's not discouraged. Come on. He saw some of you backslide. He saw some of you say you never would and you did. Oh. Is this okay? <laughs> God knows everything. He's seen everything. But love is way bigger than that stuff. And he doesn't say, man, I can't believe it. I gave him every chance to run well. And they still ain't running well. Nobody seems to love me. I'm going out of my way. I killed my own son. And they can't even lay down their own life. I'm having a bad day. I need to pick another friend. Come on. Come on, if that sounds foolish in the mouth of God, it ought to sound foolish in yours. You're made for His image. If you can't hear Him talking like that, why do you have permission? Because you see yourself apart from Him. I'm in trouble. I'm smiling. I'm not being mean. Come on. You guys all right? You still love me? Yeah. 
Good, but it wouldn't matter. <laughs> it really wouldn't matter. I want you to love me. I want to get along. But I'm going to preach the truth to you and smile. Honestly, I don't need you to love me to be okay. I, I think we should be one and we should grow together in love and all that stuff, obviously. But when I need you to know who I am, that's a sad day. The reason I can talk so plainly with you because my conscience is clear. I know why I speak what I speak. I didn't fly here because I have a need to correct you. I didn't fly here because I have a need to be right. I didn't fly here to put on a show. I didn't fly here for an honorarium, did I? Or did I request something like that? <laughs> I'm having so much fun. I flew here because of the beauty of truth and the precious value of human lives. I flew here because I knew if I'd come, you'd be here. And I was right. Here you are. It's awesome. And if there's one thing I say this weekend that helps empower you or transform you or you walk freer, then man, we've done good. But even if that doesn't be the immediate case, I've got to sow seeds and the kingdom of sowing and reaping is powerful. If you could just put the truth in somebody, then Holy Spirit will forever have a voice in that area. Because without truth, there's no hope for freedom. So I'll get on a plane and fly to San Diego at 20 or 4 in the morning, man. I'm driving to the airport. Yeah, it's like 1130 to me right now. You can tell I'm not too tired. We're going to do all right. Energizer bunny thing. Somebody called me Energizer bunny. He can't hold a light to what's inside of me. We, we, look, I have burned out these things so many times they had to take them energizers out. <laughs> while I was preaching. And put new ones in because they can't hold it. <laughs> that little bunny is no match <laughs> for what's inside of me. <laughs> Woo, man, I'm happy right now. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's truth. It'll make you free. But here's the deal. You got to believe it. You got to believe it. It's by faith. It's not by feelings. If you're waiting to feel different, you're way late. You can't let life give you that kind of attitude and opinion and put that hard edge on your heart. That's an automatic sign of deception because it's producing no life. Woo. Got your attention, didn't you? Got your attention on that one. See, because that kind of thinking will put you in darkness. See, when you're thinking like that, darkness. Seriously. What kind of fruit does that thing produce? You got that old attitude that, oh, well, you can't. Well, I, well, I, and then you're just so fixed on staying the same, you don't even have a reason anymore. You just, well, whatever. <laughs> it's like, die already. Just die. <laughs> Get water baptized. Die. Find a good pastor like me or Steve who will hold you under till the bubbles stop. <laughs> we'll get two big elders to push on your chest. Because we're men of faith. And when there ain't no more bubbles, <laughs> new life in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Die already, man. See, because, see, honestly, and I'm not mad about you trying to get people saved. I'm not. I'm not. But, but if, if you've just reduced this to a street corner prayer to go to heaven, we're missing something. Water baptism is everything about a new life. We're busy praying the street corner prayer. We don't even talk about water baptism in most cases. I'm not being legalistic and weird right now. I'm being real. There's no place in the Bible they got saved and you get water baptized immediately. There's nowhere in the Bible that they preached the gospel and didn't even preach water baptism. They preached it with the message. It was all part of being saved. Why? Because it was the transformation of life. You were going in to die so you could finally live. You were putting off the old so you could put on the new. You were entering into covenant. You were giving your whole life to him, dying in the likeness of his death so you can raise in the newness of life. 
Now we just say, if you were to die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer with me. And then we say, wow, 30 people got saved. And they just as offended, just as discouraged, and just as angry at work tomorrow. If we're not careful. And I'm not saying some people haven't gotten touched supernaturally and mercifully by God and changed in those settings. But I'm saying God never told us to teach that. He told us to teach repent, change the way you think because God's kingdom's here. And let's pursue born again, brand new life. He said, unless you're born again. He didn't say unless you quote the sinner's prayer that we made up less than 100 years ago. He said, unless you're born again. So now we do water baptism as an annual event, biannual. Water baptism is when you get saved. I, I, don't, I don't get people to pray prayers. If I can get you to water, we're going. Those people that you get to pray on the corners, ask them to go get water baptized. See how serious they are. Say, man, this is awesome. Now let's go find some water. Excuse me? Yeah. Let's go act out what you just did. Let's go to water. Well, listen, man, I got to run. My wife's expecting me, though. See, but it's cool, man. I pray. Water baptism is amazing. Why? Because it's an experience that acknowledges that you're dying to everything that ever was and being born to everything that's become. You're saying goodbye to yesterday. You're not looking back. You're not going to be Lot's wife stuck between where you came from and where you're heading. You're going to go to your destiny. You're going to get baptized unto death in the likeness of Jesus to sin once for all so you can raise in the resurrection power of Christ. You're going to recon reconcile yourself and dead to reckon yourself dead to sin and alive unto God. Water baptism. It's phenomenal. Peter said it's the answer of a good conscience towards God. It's an acknowledgement when you come out of the water that you're clean and washed in a brand new baby, born again, as if you've never sinned or eaten the tree. That the blood is speaking over you better things than Abel's blood. See, the blood of Abel marked Cain and Cain was cast out from the earth as a vagabond and etc. And then God put a mark on him so no one would kill him. So it seems like a sign of mercy, but yet he was marked for what he did for his whole life. True. And the blood of Jesus speaks better things than that, than marking you for what you've done. Oh. You know what saved Daniel from the lion's den? He said, for as much as he found me innocent in his sight, he closed the mouths of every lion. What are you through the blood of Jesus? And mouths probably ought to get clamped shut by the Holy Ghost. Huh? You probably ought to sleep at night instead of worry. You probably ought to see yourself as innocent. Because faith works through love. Yo, are you guys all right? Come on, this is good news. Now listen. God knows who you are. That's why he sent his son. He loves us. He loves us. And it's imperative that you see his first love because if you don't see his first love, you'll be reduced to serving him or just trying to live up to doctrine. And then you'll feel like you're failing and you won't have relationship with him. Are you following me? Come on. People that don't understand God's love for them are just trying to do justice to what they're supposed to. How long does that last? That grows old and you stay condemned. And you feel like a failure down in your heart. And then you don't like who you are and all that crazy stuff. So the tree's a mess. So the fruit follows. And then the fruit affirms what you believe. And the fruit says, see, see, see. And you could go 20 years like that. Go to every altar for prayer and all that stuff. And fail to just get alone with him and say, you know what? My life is more than this. You accept me and you love me. You paid an amazing price for me. And Lord Jesus, I receive your love. Father, you have to love me or you'd have never sent your son. Jesus, you wouldn't have hung on that tree and became sin and was made to be sin if you didn't want me free. Thank you for breaking every chain. That sure beats just seeking deliverance. Why don't you get along with God and thank God he broke every chain? You might be amazed what shatters and pops off of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm serious, man. My Bible says he has delivered. He has delivered me from the power of darkness. Conveyed me into the kingdom of the son of his love. So it seems right for me to just receive his love and know I'm in that kingdom. Amen? Because any other place is a place of controversy, indecision, indecisive. 
You don't know whether you're okay or not. Now you're going to live by feelings. And if you're feeling good, you may be okay. But if that doesn't last a while, there must be something wrong with me. You live by faith. The truth makes you free. How you feel is the biggest lie in your life sometimes. So you feel like God's far away, is he? So why do you live by how you feel? Why do you call a friend to pray? It's not a prayer issue. It's a truth issue. It's not a ministry issue. I shared with Pastor today, I'm concerned we've become ministry crazed. We're trying to get God reality this way. And we always want to touch in prayer and affirmation and impartation. I'm not against some of these things. They're, 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 they're right in some settings and senses. But they're overuses if we're trying to get affirmation from God these ways. You do that by simple faith in the finished work of Christ. You get alone when nobody's looking and say, Father, you love me. Thank you. You have forgiven me of everything I've ever done. And you yourself, by your power, have washed me clean. And I stand before you unashamed and excited for my life in you. I see my life as a gift this day. God, thank you for being my father. That's called prayer. Communion with God. Not pray for me so I feel better. Because if that's all you live by, then you're subject to how you feel every day. And you always need prayer because you don't feel like you could or should. Come on. What a trap. What a lie from hell. You don't wake up in the morning and not feel well spiritually and call a friend for prayer. Hey, it's one of them days, man. Can you just pray for me? No. You lift up your heart to God and say, Father, I thank you today is a gift. And God, I thank you today I'm empowered to live by my spirit. Man, it's amazing. When I woke up, it almost felt like you were far away. It almost felt like I was insignificant. That same old familiar unworthy sense came over me this morning, God. What a joke. I have to be worthy or you'd never shed the beauty of your blood. God, you made me worthy. In fact, to, the, to you, I'm the fragrance of Christ. And to the world, I'm the fragrance of your knowledge. Man, it's going to be an awesome day. I almost lived it deceived. Thank you for making me free. You guys getting this? I want you confident. I want you waking up knowing who you are. And them questions to end. Never again defining your life by the world around you, but the one that lives inside of you. Yeah. Because if it's the world around you, you're only as strong as the weakness around you. You probably ought to be as strong as the one in you. Christ in you. Hope of glory. It's more than singing about. Believe in it. And I'm a hardcore guy with this thing. And I do believe that everybody has the ability to believe. Now I'm confronted on that one on some hands. Some people say no not everybody can believe. Every man has the measure of faith. And God is not withholding the ability to believe from people. No matter what you've been through. We can put our faith in him. I believe that. You say no no some people need this. Some people have this. Some people have that. Now I don't believe anybody is damned in that matter. I believe Holy Spirit is wooing the hearts of men to him and giving everyone the platform to believe in the face of whatever. And be careful how you judge what I'm saying, because you don't know my whole life story because I don't talk about it. I wonder if I've been through hell, too. Come on, be real. Who hasn't been through some hell? My story might not be as bad as some of yours, but my story might be worse than some of yours. Why does that matter? That shouldn't even matter. Truth's what should matter. You follow me? So let's not compare our stories to our stories. All we do is find out who has a bad story. Then what do we do? The hell of the year award? I don't know. I... And now to you who've been through the most hell. So and so, come. <laughs> Give you your little, do your little speech. <laughs> you know, it's really hard sometimes. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I think it would be better to come up here excited. You know, I've been through a whole lot and it seemed like I could never be okay. But the truth of this message has really set me free because I realize now that Christ has come. I found out who I was through him. I thought these things had a, had a definition of my life. I thought these things defined me and I realize now that he's come. It's changed everything. My life really has value and potential and all these things were designed against me to rock me, to harden my heart, to blind me, and deceive me. So when the good news came, I didn't see it as good that I was mad at God or angry or insignificant. But they were all lies and they've been blown away by the truth of this gospel. That would be a whole better story. Wouldn't it? 
Instead of back off, preacher, you don't know what I've been through. What about what he's been through? Have you considered him? Are you trapped thinking about you? Feeling sorry? I'm not being insensitive. I'm being real. You can judge me insensitive. You'll be deceived on that one. I know there's some bad things that have happened to us. You say, well, I was touched wrong. Wonder if I was touched wrong. See, why do we do that? Well, I was touched. Well, wonder if I was. See, don't say I don't understand. Wonder if I do. And wonder if it doesn't matter now that he's come. Wonder if it has nothing to do with identity. Wonder if it has nothing to do with destiny. Wonder if I'm not a hurting child trying to get healed. Wonder if I'm a man of God filled with his spirit. Wonder if I'm not a victim. Wonder if I'm a recipient of the kingdom. <laughs> Wonder if the little boy we're remembering is dead. And there's a new man alive. <laughs> Come on. I think what we sing about we're supposed to believe. <laughs> I really hope you guys are getting this love message or some of you are going to get mad at me. <laughs> you guys all right? So here's the punchline. It's not enough to be loved by God. You can stop there, but that's not the will of God. In fact, if you're really receiving the love of God, you can't stop there. Because the whole reason for this is this. And you know, it's by our love. It's by our love for one another that we're sealed and marked for who we are. And it's how the world will know. It's not your animosity, issues, unresolved, church hurts and horror stories. And who did what and why you can't be involved with worship because five years ago. Come on. What does any of that have to do with who you're called to be? What does, that just means your desire was unfulfilled and your expectations were failed and you were trapped. It's about you. Look, no man owes you anything. And you owe nothing to any man but love. So why do we have so many failed expectations? Why do we have so many broken dreams? Why do we justify those things? And have our whole story laid out. And we share them again and again with people that understand. Because they feel the same way. So they relate. I said it at the, today. I said, so then that's your support system. And it allows you to stay the same. And all you do is lick each other's wounds and nobody's healed. Say, man, I'm sorry you had to go through that. Man, yeah. What? You don't need affirmed in something that's not producing life. You need taught the heart of God and how to see that situation through truth. So that the truth swallows up the pain. I'll take a step of faith and say this. It's not even a ministry of healing that takes away the pain. It's the truth. About the situation that will take away the pain. Because if it's just a ministry of healing and you don't change the platform for brokenness, you'll be broke again. I'm on, I'm talking to you now. <laughs> Look, I appreciate the attempts that we make to help each other. It's no secret that I'm not a real fan of some of the procedures we use. Because they're void of truth. They're just sensitive to the problem. Sensitive to how each other feel. I'm not an insensitive man. I just value truth. And truth's our answer. I'm not happy we've been through the stuff we've been through. But mulling over it ain't going to change it. Who's ever learned that no matter how much you regretted what you did, it never changed the truth that you did it. Or the fact that you did. But you can change. So you can never go back and change what you did that was like not cool. But guess what? You can change. So when you change, are you the person that did what you remember? Will you ever answer for it or stand before God in the matter? 
then it's dead. Simple. So see, God knows our dilemma. You can't change where you've been and what you've done. But you can change. And the day I change is the day I'm separated from the man we're talking about. And the blood of Jesus washes me and cleanses me of all sin. And I come out of it brand new and converted, refreshed in the presence of the Lord. That's a pretty good gospel, guys. God knows our dilemma. No matter how much you wish you didn't go there, you went there. No matter how much you wish you didn't do it, you did it. But the fact that you wish you didn't means change has already taken place. And there's something inside of you happening called good. You get it? So that's what God wants. So don't be hard on yourself. Forgive yourself. Release yourself. And say, wow, I'm so glad that was a hard learned lesson, but a lesson nonetheless. And I'm wiser, sharper and smarter than I've ever been before. And then go on receiving the love of God. So here's the deal. It's not enough to be loved by God. It's only enough to become that love. And that's where we're heading, guys. And we'll probably talk about it all weekend because I think your little flyer said. Become in love. We're going to camp there, I guess. But I'm just introducing you tonight to what we're called to. Listen, I'm going to make a bold, strong, narrow statement. That's how the gospel is. The only reason you're alive is to bear witness of God's image. Anything less is a perversion of your created value. I'm not saying that makes you evil. You might not just understand, but it brings chaos into your life. Anything less takes you out of the grace of what you're created for. It's like putting metal in the microwave. That's why life's so frustrating sometimes. That's why people get under your skin because you expect of them. And so as much as I know you're called to live trustworthy, right? As soon as I expect you to at the cost of who I am, I'm setting you up to fail me and me to be disappointed. That's a bummer. And then when I hear your name, all I can think about is what you didn't fulfill instead of who you're called to be. And then they say, do you know, what is your name? What is it? They say, do you know Christina? And I say, oh, yeah, I know Christina. And I might even not even give way to it or give imply what. I, but in my mind, in my heart, I'm thinking about what she failed. Because I put expectation on it. At the cost of reputation, destiny, potential. Now, if God saw you that way, you're trashed in his sight. And so am I. Whoever, after the knowledge of truth, went ahead and did something otherwise. Who? Anybody? So if God handled that the way we handle one another in that, we're in big trouble. So I think we probably ought to follow him instead of one another. And please, let's not reduce ourselves and say, well, that's God. That's the way God is. But we're just people. Know your people made in his image in the same spirit to raise Christ from the dead lives in you. And as the father sent Jesus, he sent you. He said, if any man says he abides in him, he ought to walk even as he walked. If you walk in the light as he's in the light, you have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no need of the blood, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Of all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned. Well then we're twisted. Isn't that awesome? So you can live righteous can't you? You can live free from the consciousness of sin can't you? And you can become love. Jesus said this in John 17. And I'm, I'm winding down here. Closing. I'm closing. I'm not winding down. That's a scary term. Winding down. Because my tape's not holding anymore. So I must be out of grace huh? I'm certainly not out of gas. <laughs> I'm so messing up. God, how do we just close this down? Okay. Jesus said in John 17. Father. When they become one as you and me are one. Then the world will know. 
He didn't say when you put the gospel on every radio station. He didn't say when you reach with technology to the bush. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying. He said when they become one. Like we're one. Then the world's going to know you sent your son. Until then, it's going to be reduced to doctrine, belief system, the crutch you lean on. Your faith, and there's just going to be a whole lot of. Learn to live together bumper stickers out there with everybody's belief symbols on it. <laughs> when they become one. As we're one. And the world will know. I wonder if your days of complaining could end forever. I wonder if feeling sorry for yourself is a thing of the past. I wonder if you get so alone with God and grow in relationship with Him and just count yourself crucified in prayer and in the presence of God that grace begins to make you this way, that you're just a living, walking person of love that's looking for truth. And all of a sudden, people do you wrong and you don't even know how to cry for you anymore. You just weep because people don't understand who they are and their destiny and value. And all of a sudden, your heart is aching for people. And even though it feels like you're hanging on a cross, all you can say is, forgive them, Father. They just don't know what they're doing. And all of a sudden, you don't need prayer, and you're not a basket case, and you're not run dry. Do you know they spent 40 years in the wilderness wandering? We know the story so well. We preached the life out of that thing almost. Actually, there wasn't much life in it. It's more tragic than anything, isn't it? But there's another wilderness in the Bible. It's amazing. As soon as Holy Spirit came upon Jesus coming up from water baptism. <laughs> unto all righteousness. Whoa. Man, do yourself a favor and get baptized. I baptized myself. I didn't even know if it was legal. <laughs> I was just in water. I was fresh saved. And I thought about water baptism. And it got so intimate. When I come up out of the water, it was so ushy, gushy, intimate. It was ridiculous. Jesus was right there holding me. Holy Spirit with midwife just held me. He just showed me to Papa. Look, Papa, brand new baby boy. Oh, it was awesome. Because nobody was there. It was just my witness in my heart before God. And I don't know if it was legal. I just, but he seemed to be okay with it. I was like, Lord, my life is yours. And when I go under this water, I'm calling everything dead, everything I've ever been, everything I ever was. And I'm just giving my whole life to you and doing this as a sign of my commitment to you. You consume me and fill me with all that you are. Let the eyes I look through. And I just prayed. I went under. And the bubble stopped. <laughs> and I just came up and the presence of God was just all over me. And he was just affirming that my heart was for him and towards him. It's a beautiful thing. Don't rob yourself of that. Don't say, well, I don't need to get baptized to be saved. Why wouldn't you get baptized? Jesus said, believe and be. He's probably right. <laughs> See, we say we're running from legalistic people and then we ask legalistic questions. What well, do I need to get water baptized to get saved? Why wouldn't you if there's a grace waiting for you there? And then people come up with these weird things. Did you ever hear them? And we fight over stuff and make camps and dig things that God never made and dug. We say, well, if somebody gets saved on a plane and then that crashes and they never got baptized, are you saying they're not saved? Who said that? Do <laughs> you see how analytical we get? And we make simple things very weird. And then we build camps and stuff and defend against all this stuff and and then we say, well, will you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Jesus? Because it wasn't legal if it wasn't Jesus. And there's just camps and feuds over this crazy stuff. And we prove that we missed the whole point because we're mad at each other. And we've been reduced by the devil to religion and doctrine instead of heart. And we can't even sit in a room because we don't believe the same. Well, they got believe. Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Heresy, they ain't even saved. They going to hell. <laughs> Peter said in the name of Jesus, Jesus, New Testament, New Covenant. 
There's fights over that stuff. When he's the fullness of the Godhead and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the Godhead and Jesus said you could do it that way, it's all the same. Hello? And if you have a preference, fine, but don't fight. It's the same. It's all the same. I actually enjoy in the name of the Father and I say your Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, your Lord and King and Savior, the fire and power and person. Of the Holy Spirit. That's how we do it. This is not a joke. I was in northern Pennsylvania and we did a spontaneous baptism and people were coming up bawling and we were baptized and it was right during service. It was fun. People were, you know God's moving to America when people get baptized and drive home wet. When they're inconvenienced to get in their car wet in America, that's a move of God right there. <laughs> 17 people soaking wet going to their car. Oh, Jesus. Sweat. <laughs> totally not inconvenienced. Man, that's a move of God. <laughs> this young boy, this is it true? This young kid, he gets in this, it was a hot tub. So it had all them different things in it. And it was hard to find a good space for everybody because there was little humps and seats and <laughs> knobs. And we're trying to get them under, you know. We didn't want to leave an elbow up and think it was uns <laughs> unsanctified, you know. The defiled part of their body. We're, we're trying to get all the body parts under. You women, you know, you go under and your hair floats and you push it under. <laughs> so... <laughs> We did that to this lady. The man said, don't get her hair wet. And everybody laughed. We put her under and her hair floated right on the water. She went under and her hair floated. I never seen anything like it. She came up and it went right back to where it was. It was unbelievable. I was like, I didn't do well. I didn't do right because I was so freaked out by it. I just pushed her to the bottom. I, I had to get it wet. It, I did. I, I almost drowned her. She came up. <laughs> I said, oh, it's wet. Yes. Everybody lost it, man. We put her under and her blonde hair just went. <laughs> Everything was the same. <laughs> I shoved her under. Pushed her under. Every wet muskrat. She came up muskrat. This kid goes under, we put him under, and we couldn't like get his shoulder under because the way he was in there. So we were having trouble, me and the pastor, and I said, move him, just get that under, push. And while we're pushing and pushing, he starts pushing back. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. I thought he was just trying to adjust and help us at first, and then I thought, no, he's, he's pushing back. So we're trying to get his shoulder under because we didn't want nobody getting weird saying, you know, that shoulder didn't get wet. And then, you know, they're staying on the left side instead of the right because his shoulder wasn't baptized. Or whatever. Yeah. And these people get funny about stuff, man. So we just wanted, for conscience sake, get him under the water. Well, we finally get him under, and as we're letting him up, he comes busting out, and his eyes are that big. It, I thought we ruined his whole experience of baptism, man. I was like, are you okay? What? And then it hit me. Oh, my goodness, he took me serious. He thought we were holding him under. I said, did you think we... The bubbles? Yeah, dude. I thought maybe I need to quit saying that. Because we're pushing on him. He's trying to come up. He feels this. We keep him under. A little longer than normal. And his mind said, oh my God, he's serious. He must think I really need to die. He said, I wasn't ready for this. He started coming up for air. And we kept pushing. And when we brought him up, he's like... He was wired, man. It looked like he was going to fight. <laughs> so we had to smooth it over, and, and Grace came, and, and he still had a good experience. But it was, <laughs> thought we were drowning him, Steve. I won't read this whole thing, but if you have a Bible, just Colossians. I won't. Colossians 3. I, the whole thing is beautiful. 
But in 12, it's telling us to put on tender mercies and kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also do. It doesn't say call a friend and tell them what the person did so they can pray. Yeah. It says to put off, put on all these tender mercies after it says put off the things of the flesh, like fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness. It's all idolatry. Put off anger. Wrath, malice, blasphemy, language out of your mouth, it's filthy. Don't lie to one another. Why? Because you put off the old man and his deeds. It's simple. Why wouldn't I lie to you? Because I put off the old man. I'm not that man. If I lie, I'm saving myself. It has something to do with me. Right? It says don't lie to one another. That's not a chore. Put off anger. That doesn't mean bite your lip and try not to get angry. It means recognize you were never created for it. You're created for love. The only reason you could be angry is because you're thinking for yourself. And you have rights and people violate you. Come on, we could be so shallow. I said it this morning, man. We could, we could go to church, sing holy is the Lord, have an encounter with God at the altar, and fight on the way home over where we're going to eat and have animosity in the car because we didn't get our choice. After church. And call it normal. And actually have a rift in the car and fight. Siblings could tear that thing up. Well, you always get to pick. Well, you're so selfish. When do I get my choice? And all of a sudden, they don't realize that they're being the same way. Look, who cares where we eat? Let's thank God we got food on every corner. And let's just be happy that the people we're with are blessed. Why is that hard? Why is it all about me and having it my way? Because Burger King advertises that way. When you go there. Desire and covetous stuff. Desire that we call normal. Well, God gave us our sex drive. No, your sex drive was perverted. God never gave you a sex drive at the expense of another human being. He never created another human being to fulfill your pleasure. He made you people to love and love one another in a healthy and holy way. I'm serious. He didn't make you to covet one another's bodies and he didn't make men to look at a picture and get all kinds of fantasies. Come on. Don't you buy into that. That is low, man. Don't think God made us that way. You women, I'm talking to you too. <laughs> we, get, we got so beat up in the fall. You women, I cry for you because you're under this pressure and you feel and you got to be a certain way and you got to have somebody to want you to be attractive and all. Ah. 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 Ah, it's wretched. Oh, you want them to see the honor of who you are and be willing to lay down their life for you because they see the value of your life. <laughs> Why? Just because somebody wants to sleep with somebody it makes them special. They'll sleep with somebody they never met. They'll look at a picture and get aroused. Why does that? That makes you one of millions, not one in millions. You don't want to be in that lot. And as a man, I don't want to live that way. I want to challenge that and say, God, you couldn't have made me this way. It's at the expense of another human being and it's completely self-serving. I believe we're to put off our sex drive as we know it so the Holy Ghost can dress us rightly. Because everything about you and me was born into Adam and it all must become new and it all must be born again. I've never read a Christian book on sexuality that's even close to what I believe the truth is. It's all the world painted Christian. We've just taken the world and put Christian terms in there. Now we have our needs, the needs of men, the needs of women. Now we're set up to fail each other. And now if the one's needs aren't met, they have a right to be less than Christ because their spouse didn't meet their needs. We teach that stuff in churches. Now you have an excuse to be less than who He is. And who He is is the only one that defines you, but you're using other things to define you. It gets twisted. I don't know how I get on this stuff. I was trying to close. Yeah. Some of you guys are thinking, I wish he'd think for himself and say it's 12.08 to his body. Just wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> See, I don't think for me. I'll preach till daybreak.
But no, I won't preach today, Brett. <laughs> so we're going to put off these things. Here's how I put them off. I get alone with God in prayer. And I release faith in that truth. Father, you never made me to live at the expense of another human being. Even my own wife. God, I don't want to lust after her. That shouldn't make her feel precious and special. Because if I lust after her, I could lust after anyone. I want to love her. I want to love her like you would love her if you were in my shoes. Man, I want to love her with honor, with integrity, with holiness, God. I want to see the value of that woman just like you do. And I don't ever want again touch her like a man touches a woman. I want to touch her like you touch a woman. And I just thank you for empowering me to love in a supernatural, wonderful way, the way I believe I was created to love. And God, I thank you that you didn't make me to be self-centered and self-serving and driven by needs. You made me to be complete in Christ and fulfilled in you so that I can be a blessing and have something to give. And Father, with nobody in this room looking, I'm just playing right now, a bedroom, because you're all looking. <laughs> with nobody in this room looking, I thank you that you have changed my life forever and you never made me for anger, frustration, bitterness, jealousy, pride. They were the things I became when Adam ate the tree. I was born into that lie, but I'm born again now. And Father, openly I just put those off before your presence and I say they were never my creative value. They're not my desire nor my will. And Father, I thank you that you're making me like you. And I thank you, your love. Holy Spirit, have your way in me. And all of a sudden, as you release faith in the truth, the grace of change comes upon your life. And all of a sudden, Holy Spirit makes you what you could never be in your own strength. And all of a sudden, all glory goes to Him. Because you're not self-made. You didn't bite your lip to change. Because if you bite your lip to change, who found that you fail? But if you trust yourself to Him, His grace is sufficient for you. And you are what you are by the grace of God. You're saved by grace through no faith, no grace. Release faith, grace, the etching tool of God. It comes and sculpts you and shapes you and makes you what you believe is possible. And here's all God needs. He needs you to be willing. He doesn't need you to hold on to your rights and draw lines and have chips on your shoulder and things people can cross. Well, I'll love unless. Well, I'll love up until. Sit and paint analogies and get analytical. Well, you're telling me if somebody and paint the most grossest picture and I'm supposed to love? And all of a sudden you're finding a way out instead of a way in. And all of a sudden you're holding on to something you're not, never called to be. Why do we do that? I've been asked the craziest questions when I preach on love. Well, you're telling me if, and they paint these terrible scenarios of horror stuff. Well, I could tell you a few. I know of a lady whose daughter got raped and killed by a man. And she went into the prison and cried for him through the glass and said, I'm not mad at you, I cry for you, your soul's in trouble. My daughter's safe, she's fine, she's with Jesus. Of course I miss her, but I know Jesus way too much to be lo lost, forlorn, angry, and mad at you. I cry for you, sir. You have no idea who you are to, to do this atrocity to my daughter. I didn't come here to shame you, blame you, or condemn you. I came here to tell you, I love you, cry for you, and pray for you. He lost it. He wrecked and wiped out and got born again. They'd be, watch. This, I, 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 can't, I, I wish I could track them. I don't even know if they're around anymore because I had saved 18 years. and It was the first year I got saved. I read the article in a magazine and I cried. She, he was in prison a long time. Because they were up in years. They might not even be alive today. But somebody could probably track who these people are with all the information out there nowadays. She petitioned for his release from the prison as the mother of the victim. Because his life was so changed. And she pushed so hard that one day after serving a bunch of time, she got this appeal and got his sentence. He got released. They became ministry partners, best friends. The man that raped and killed her daughter traveled and preached in churches on love and forgiveness. Now come on moms, be challenged. Because see, here's what we do. We covet the gift of God at the cost of who He is. And we covet the gift called our children and our spouses and our family, but it's at the cost of who He is. And if something doesn't go right here, He's not the one manifested. He's the one blamed or 
Whatever. God never gave you the gift of family and children and wives and husbands at the cost of who He is. So no matter what happens, who He is is to be manifested. Because the believer understands we never lose and we never die. The believer understands we've already won. So live like it. Do you get it? So did she lose when her daughter got raped and killed? Not in the big picture of life. Of course it's tragic. Of course it should never happen. Of course it's a horrible, terrible expression of fallen man and sin and the devil. And you could sit all day and get in like, well, why would God let that? And how come she, and did she open a door? And how come? And accomplish what? How about manifest the heart of God now that it happened? How about rise up and manifest Jesus in the face of it all? And overcome evil with good instead of repaying evil for evil. Letting mercy triumph over judgment and love cover a multitude of sin. Did he say unless or except for this sin or that sin? Or did he just say love? Do you think Jesus loves that man? Do you think there's hope for him and he wants him to repent and change? Then why can't the Christian that's the body of Christ that represents Christ feel the same way? Here's what he said in John 20. As the Father sent me, I send you. If you forgive the sins of any, They'll be forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they shall be retained. What's that really mean? When do you have permission to be in unforgiveness? When do you have permission to judge men for what they've done and see them for their failures? You show me one scripture that gives you permission to live in unforgiveness. Is there any? Anybody up there in high places? So then why is Jesus talking to his disciples that way as if he's giving them the option of not forgiving? It sounds like it. If you forgive the sins of any, they'll be forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they'll be retained. When do you have permission to retain sins? So why is God talking to his disciples as if he's giving them permission and the option to retain sins? That's what it sounds like, but it can't be possible, can it? What do you think he's saying? It's on the heels of saying this. As the Father sent me, I send you. How'd the Father send him? Perfect love and perfect forgiveness. Forgive him, Father. They know not what they do and he died for humanity. He said, follow me, guys. He said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Things they did to me, they'll do to you. Didn't he? So what's he saying? Let's paraphrase what he's saying. You're now my body. You're now my people. You're the manifestation of Christ. You're the expression of God on the earth. You're the fragrance of Christ. And if you walk in love and forgive men like I've walked in love and forgiven you, they'll see the way to me just like you've seen the way to me. But if you harden your heart and retain their sins and you're the expression of who I am and you misrepresent that expression and don't love them the way I've loved you, then how will those sins not be retained? They'll have to be because there'll be no way for forgiveness. There'll be no way for them to see their way to the Savior because love's been made void. And look how the church in many areas have become legalistic, controlling, full of works, rules, regulations, and void of love. I bet the big attack's been on love. It's the power that'll change the whole world you forgive the sins of any they'll be what why because you keep the door open for mercy to triumph but if you retain sins they shall be retained why you're the only expression on the earth of God the body of Christ you follow me that's pretty intense because he made us in his image and through Christ we're restored back to that image we were made to love we became in need of love we got grafted back in that needs fulfilled We know who we are now. We were born in identity crisis. Our true identities come. Make sense? So it's the whole reason you're alive. It's the whole reason you're a Christian. You don't put metal in the microwave, remember? Don't live for yourself. I'm going to pray something corporate over you guys and then uh, we'll do something. It won't take long. We'll do it quick. But not insignificantly. We'll do it quick but full of heart, okay? Okay.
just quick for the sake of time. And because you guys are coming, I guess you're coming back tomorrow. I'll be here. <laughs> Pastor and I'll be here. We'll see if I ran anybody off. I hope you heard. I felt like you really have ears to hear in this house. I feel like I could talk so freely everywhere I go because I know my heart and my motives right in what I say. But there's places I go where I feel like they're really hearing it at large. And that's how I feel tonight in this house. I really, I'm not saying that for a, any other thing, but that's what I perceive. I feel like you guys are ready to hear the things that I'm crying out. And that it's just time to say yes to this gospel. Amen? Amen. Come on, I've had my issues and you've had yours. It's never accomplished nothing. It's not fun to have issues. Is it? Come on, I've been discouraged like you've been discouraged. It's just not a cool place. How many of you have been angry and hard and hurt in your heart? How many of you have held resentment towards people? You can't tell me you're blessed in that place. About the only thing you are is trying to convince yourself you're right. But everything about it's wrong. So let's just release ourselves from permission to be found in those places. I said it this morning and I say it a lot. I hear people say, well, I'm trying to forgive. Give me my space. I need time. I'm trying to forgive. Why do we have such a grid for unforgiveness? Wouldn't it be awesome if we didn't even understand unforgiveness? Heaven doesn't. Heaven doesn't understand unforgiveness. Or you wouldn't be forgiven. Some of you would not be forgiven. All of us. I'm just having fun. So why don't we throw away the grid for unforgiveness and say, I have one call, it's to love. And the cross of Christ isn't even fulfilled until my nature is restored back to that place. And it's restored back to that place when I find myself alone with Him and thanking Him that who He is is inside of me and it's my whole desire to manifest His great name. And Father, I see the only reason I'm alive is for your image. And I thank you that in that is the true blessing. Because if you seek God first in his kingdom and his righteousness, everything you'll ever need is added unto you. People come to church for what God might do for them. The reason he's here is for how he can make you more like him. You can get all your surface needs met and miss his heart. We say the kingdom of God on earth that is in heaven. It's the big teaching on the earth today, which is true. It's a good teaching, but it's really emphasized a lot. The kingdom of God is at hand and the way it is, the Lord's prayer on earth as it is in heaven. Wonder if, wonder if that has a whole lot more to do with the heart of God than the power of God. I wonder if his will on earth as in heaven has to do with the way God thinks and how he's motivated and where he flows from instead of just what he does. Do you know you can have the knowledge of all mysteries? Faith to move all mountains? That's extreme. That's unlimited. That's a spiritual icon. If there's somebody out there with the faith to move all mountains and knowledge of all mysteries unlimited... Come on, that's the closest thing to Jesus you and I have ever seen. That is surely the keynote speaker at every world conference and everybody, everybody wants that person to lay hands on them. Be real. And we're thronging them so bad they can't even breathe. Why? Because they have knowledge of all mysteries and faith to move all mountains. And I got a few mountains and I'm getting to that guy or that girl. And that's how we think. But the Bible says if that person doesn't have love, they've got nothing. How can that be possible? Because then everything that's flowing is flowing from somewhere that's not God's love. So even if it's God's gifting, it's going to catch up. Something's not going to be right in a while. You can give all your goods to the poor and your body to be burned. And if you don't have love, it's nothing. Given to the poor is a godly commandment. It's God to give to the poor. But you can fulfill given to the poor without love and come up empty. Why? Because you're giving everything. Now the poor will get blessed with what you give them. But you have your reward in already. Because your reason for giving has something other to do with love. So it has to do with yourself. Whether them appreciating you. Feeling good about yourself. Qualifying what you say you are. 
Do you know sometimes people do Christian things to make themselves feel qualified for being a Christian? Do you know I took a group of people out to hand out tracts in the city one time because we'd go like twice a year because we thought that was God? And these ladies ran up and gave this precious black man a track and said Jesus loved him and he was so sharp, man. He said, oh, thank you, ladies. I believe he does love me. My question is, I don't, I don't know if you do. I don't think you love me. And they were like, excuse us. He said, no, actually, I think you're part of a church group and you're doing an annual or biannual thing that you do to make yourself feel good about what you say you are. He said, my question is, when's the last time you handed out a track apart from your little church group or your evangelistic night? And when's the last time you ever told anybody in public that Jesus loved them? See, I think it's what you're doing. I don't think it's who you are. But thank you. I do believe Jesus loves me. I just think you guys need to get a grip. <laughs> and he turned and walked away. And I said, get in the cars. We're going back. Because <laughs> we had this evangelist guy at the church. And he was like, you know, we need to storm the city. We need to go out every once in a while. Storm in the city is not going out every once in a while as a church group. It's walking in love every day. Storm in the city is you walking in love. Come on. How many faces am I looking at that are from this general area? So you walk in love every day and just touch somebody with the love of God every day. Just a good gesture, a kind thing. Just bless somebody, pay for something, help somebody, pray for a healing, encourage somebody, get a word, whatever it is. You multiply all the faces I'm looking at by just loving one person a day times a month. Times a year. You've just affected your city. Hello? Boy, that sure beats going to church. <laughs> Sounds like be in the church. No, you keep gathering here. But the only reason you gather here is to look more like Him when you leave. You're not gathering here to qualify your Christianity. Or to be a part of something you like. Because if that changes, you might leave. <laughs> Ever experienced that? If that one thing you like changes, there you're out of here. We're not called the church shop. We're called to be a family and be one and understand why we're saved. If you really listen to where God wants you, you might go to places you're really challenged and be around people that challenge you. Because God wants to grow you. But you're going to go to where it's all cool. And maybe stay not cool. <laughs> Are you guys okay? Okay, I'm going to close this book. I only quoted it tonight anyway. I haven't really preached out of it. So that doesn't even mean anything. Better close the book. Did you see in Colossians 3 verse 14 says above all these things. Above all these things that you're putting off and putting on. Yeah. Above all these things. Put on love. Because yeah. it's the bond of perfection. Yeah. We can be complete in Him. He wouldn't give us the commandment of love if it wasn't possible. So don't you sell cheap. You've been bought way too costly. <laughs> Don't let intellect and rationale talk you out of what God can make possible. I said it this morning. I'm going to say it now. The only thing that can keep you from becoming love is not wanting to. I promise you. You not wanting to become love is the only thing that keeps you from becoming love. You hold on to a certain right you draw a certain line and somebody crosses it. And now you have a yell but in your vocabulary. Yeah. And you have a I would be if it wasn't for. And we make that thing Lord instead of the one in us. I know it's a strong challenge. I can feel that in the room. That's okay. Let me get a little sober and straight in closing. You have to want to become love. To become love. And I've learned that not everybody wants to become love. People want to hold on to what they inherited through the fall. And hold on to their rights. How can you deny yourself and possess rights? Well, brother, I'm not going to let anybody use me as a doormat. And I don't want to enable people. That's a psychological cop-out. Stop it. 
Come on, Jesus didn't enable people and he wasn't a doormat. Hello? I'm not talking about some passive, pushover, mushy thing. I'm talking about your heart not being changed apart from God's heart based on people. So that everything you do, even if it's a correction, it comes from love. Because honestly, if you don't have love, don't correct anybody. You don't have grace to correct anyone. You're really just trying to set them straight and it's actually prideful. Because you just found out what's wrong with them and you're just trying to fix them. You don't even really care about them. If it's not love, you're not correcting them for their sake. You're correcting them so they don't bug you anymore. (laughs) Is it okay if I'm honest? Come on, you have no authority to correct people if you don't love people. That's why it never works out when you try to do it. Whoever went into that arena and it got worse? Blech. Come on, you have no authority to speak into people's lives if you don't see their value and love them. Why do you expect God to go with your words and attend your words if you're not attending to His heart? Why do you expect Him to back your conversation because you're right and they're wrong? If He was right, you're wrong. But He made you right. And we need to learn how to make people right. You following me? Can we pray now? You're going, he ain't serious. <laughs> but I am serious. I just don't always get there. I don't know, but I just feel good about talking about these things. And I feel like you're getting it. I feel like you want it. I only feel like a couple people are bothered by me. It's just a couple. It's, it's a small amount. I could point you out now. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. (laughs) Let's do it this way. I don't usually do it this way, but I want to pray, guys. I want to pray over you a grace that I believe is in the room. And if you really want it and you're really serious about becoming love, now, don't all just do this because I'm saying it and you don't want to look like you're out and not in. I want you to stand to your feet as a whole. I feel like almost all of you will want to stand. But if you don't want to stand, don't stand. If you're not sure where I'm at with all this, just stay sitting. It's okay. Because I don't want you to play church. God forbid you play church. But by standing, what you're saying is, I want this grace you're talking about. And God, I really don't want the right to have a right. I want the right to be like you. That's why you're standing, okay? That's why I have you standing. So if that's not why you're standing, just... Sit down. We won't stereotype you. I'm not... Well, I am kind of looking. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is, it's a form of honor. It's a submission. It's a surrender. In a minute, I'm going to actually ask you, if you want to, to lift your hands to Him because it's actually a sign of surrender and yielding to Him. It's just a sign of humility. It's not any control. It's not a works. It's just a sign of, I'm open to you. I want you. And I'm saying, have your way in me, God. That's what we're going to do when we pray. So if that's your heart... Just man, lift your hands to Him and get before Him right now. And just, just begin to yield yourself to Him the best you understand. And you tell Him from your heart right now that you're really serious, that you want to put off everything that's of old, of flesh, of Adam, and you want to put on Christ. And I don't want a right to have a right except to be like you, God. You just settle that in your heart and we're going to pray. You be honest. You be real with God right now, no matter where your life was when you walked in here. You might not even been born again. It doesn't matter to me. You can get born again standing there with your hands raised. Make sure you tell me though so we can baptize you and hold you down. (laughs) You ain't escaping water. And we will. If you got born again tonight while we're praying this, you come up and say, I was never saved, but man, I never really understood it. I got saved. We'll baptize you this weekend. We'll make it happen. We're in, man, we're in San Diego. There's water everywhere. (laughs) I'll baptize you. I've baptized two people in my hotel bathtub, in my room. And I baptized more people in the hotel swimming pools where I stayed than I can remember. Because I'm a baptizer. So Father, with our hands lifted before You, we just say we don't want our own lives, we want Your life in us. When we look through our eyes, we want to see what You've always beheld. And we thank You that by grace our hearts are one with You. You paid an amazing price, Father. You sent Your Son to become what we were 
so we could become what you are. Man, I'm not in this thing for blessing. I'm not in this thing just to go to heaven. Thank you for blessing and thank you for everlasting life. In all sincerity, thank you that our names are in the book of life. We celebrate that. That is not our motive. Our motive is your nature. Our motive is transformation. Our motive is that the way that seems right to man never ever is our wisdom again. But the way that produces life, the way that's God, the way, the way, the truth, Christ in us, the life. Father, we yield to you right now with our hands raised as a house, as a family. We're asking you to perfect us in love. We're asking for grace to come into our individual hearts that makes us more conscious and aware of who you are in us than ever before and who you are in us as a whole than ever before. Man, I'm really seeing this. I'm seeing a corporate anointing that just joins us and makes us one like never before. That just resolves animosities. That erases the ability to have fallouts. And just changes the way we see one another. Takes the expectation off of one another and puts it on the Lord who never fails. So Father, I just thank you that you're making us one in this whole thing. That God, you're, you're bringing a corporate, synergistic union of love like we've never known. I believe that tonight. And I'm asking for that grace and I'm proclaiming it at the same time. And Father, I thank you individually and personally. If you would, just put your own hand on your heart right now. And I'm just saying personally, individually, I ask that you touch us, everyone, in a special way tonight. Increase our understanding. Increase the revelation of love. Increase the expression of the nature of God without effort, without toil. Just because we're willing. And I believe we're willing. I believe you've convinced us tonight. I believe you've drawn our hearts. So Father, we yield ourselves to you and thank you for the grace that abounds in our lives. In Jesus' holy name. Amen? Amen. Amen.